This video is not meant as an argument of why we don't want to keep using traditional farms. No matter what, we will still continue to need outdoor farming, you know? Stuff like corn, wheat, all these other crops just can never really be grown in vertical farming, at least not with current technologies. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to Grow Space Vertical Farms. I've been meaning to make a video like this where I really just sit down and I explain everything there is to know about Grow Space Vertical Farms. Why we exist, what we're doing, um, and everything there really is to know, and why we've made certain business decisions. Like, why do we use subscription methods? Or why do we um, try to avoid being in grocery stores? And I hope that this video will help clarify exactly what I'm trying to do and what we're trying to do here at Grow Space Vertical Farms. So let's get right into it. So why did we choose vertical farming instead of an industry that has a lot more success, right? An industry that's ready to improve it. Uh, there are a few key big reasons, and uh, this is a why that every company has, right? Why did you choose to start a restaurant? Why did you choose to start an online retail store, right? There's always a reason um, beyond making money, right? Because if you just wanted to make money, it would be a way different industry, way different world for that matter. So the first big reason, and really the spark for starting growth space was the freshness. The how healthy is our produce? How healthy is the food we eat? We can get more nutrients into these plants, which is, seems ridiculous. Like, oh, hey, we've been doing it for thousands of years, stick it in the dirt. How the heck could we get more nutrients out of a new system than out of what's existed for thousands of years? It seems crazy, right? But it is completely possible. And the big way that it is, is that our soils are degrading. So because of the soil degradation that we are seeing in our you know, fields, right? This is what led to like events like the Dust Bowl. We are able to actually create those perfect nutrients where in the fields where lettuce is currently grown and other produce, it's been primarily drained. So they don't have as much nutrients as they once did. So it's way better for the soil health in the long term because we are absent. So what that allows us to do is we can drastically reduce the amount of crap in our food. And for number two of the why of grow space, right? Why does grow space exist? Is our need to be local. So the big issue here is that we need to ship produce from other parts of the country and even the world. So bananas, as an example, come from South America. And in our case, lettuce is coming primarily from California and Arizona. Still within our country, but it's still traveling 2,000 miles to get here in Wisconsin. So we're getting this produce shipped from all over the world. It's releasing a crap ton of emissions. We're losing all kinds of nutrients from it being traveled that long. And we're overall increasing food waste because not all the food's going to survive the journey. So how do we fix that? The way we fix that is with local farms. You've seen them everywhere, right? You see them at the grocery store. Oh, this is locally grown. Okay, great. Oh, this thing of blueberries. Oh, okay, great. Locally grown. The thing is, winter herbs. Oh no, where's all that locally grown produce going? It's gone, right? Because they can't grow, it's the middle of the winter. So what do we do? We now can grow indoors. Now you can still get your produce from right up the road, sometimes even closer than that locally grown produce was originally. And now it goes right to you. Skip all the grocery store issues, bring a better product to you. There are other ways to reduce emissions in agriculture, like plant-based diets and um, all these other various methods. But for most people, that just is like an absurd, radical idea that they don't want to admit. One of the big reasons is we don't need all the machinery. Now, we don't need the machinery, but we need this. A absolute crap ton of really bright lights. Not that great as far as emissions are concerned, but it actually is roughly similar to what we're getting from the farm machine. Now, how is it better for emissions then? Why is it better for emissions if it's really seeing about the same? And that is where we come to tilling the soil. Whenever a one of these tractors that's releasing a lot of emissions tills the soil, it's actually releasing a lot of carbon. And that is coming from the roots and whatever other decaying matter is in there is getting jostled up. It's getting jostled up. It's getting removed from a safe place, not in the air, inside of the dirt, and it's getting right into the air. Now, we don't really want that, of course, and we can get rid of that by growing indoors. Now, is this a solve all solution for climate change? Hell no, this is not a solution to climate change. It is a step in the right direction. Not all produce can be grown vertically, and not all produce can be grown profitably vertically. Uh, stuff like trees, like why would you ever grow a tree indoors? It'll be very difficult to do so if somebody ever figures out. People have had success and people like growing bananas and stuff crazy, but it's not profitable yet. So we've got some time where there are still a lot of places where it makes more sense to be growing the dirt. The other big thing is land use, right? That's a big other huge benefit of vertical farming. 
This farm, once completely built out, will be equivalent to around a 5 acre farm. It's currently close to like a 1.8 to like a 2.2 acre farm as far as production is concerned. Um, but it is way less space because here I am sitting on, I think it's roughly half a city lot that of space, just of one floor. So we're using half a city lot on one floor, we have a whole second story. So it's way better for land use. Now, why is land use an issue? When you go around the country, you go through the county, you see, oh my gosh, there's all these empty fields filled with crops, filled with forests, whatever. The thing is, a lot of that land use is already being taken. In the United States, around 8% of land is not dedicated to a specific purpose, either that's farming or housing, or it's a national reserve of some kind. But of that 8%, what are we going to do, right? So we also need to expand our cities. We also need to expand our agriculture, right? So where are we going to expand into as our country and our Western world continue to expand? And it seems the most logical place, and you even see this in some real places where you see these big old suburbs that are sprawling. People are buying a farmland to put houses in. Wait, we still need to grow that food. Where do we grow that food? So we need to keep expanding our cities, keep expanding our societies, not out of really a need, but because we have to, because we have more people, right? So more people, we need more land for housing. The housing comes in and it buys up all of the farmland. Okay, right? Now where's the farmland? It keeps going out and out. Eventually we'll run out of land. 8% might sound like a lot, and it might look like a lot, but as our population continues to grow, especially if we need to start growing for other parts of the world, which we most likely will need to, it's going to be an endless battle of where we just don't have enough land to do everything. And that is where this can come in, right? We are now inside of a building in a city, it's not taking up a lot of land, and it's right in the local heart of the city. No need to ship across the country. Huge improvement. And the last big thing is that we're absent from the environment. We're not a part of the environment. We're in our own little human man-made bubble, right? We don't have to worry about there's a rabbit that we just ran over with our tractor or, oh, uh, a rabbits keep getting in and we're affecting the population, right? We're increasing the population of rabbits because there's more food for them, right? We're affecting the natural landscape pretty significantly with our agriculture. And with a facility like this, we don't have any effect on the environment. We just kind of plop our butts here. We just chill, we grow our produce, give it to humans. It doesn't really affect the natural environment. So hydroponics has existed since around the 1970s. It's been used primarily for wheat, which we do not grow. Anyways, now in the past 10 to 20 years, uh, we've started to see it be more and more used for real produce, produce like lettuce that we're actually eating for, you know, not fun. Like, not in brownies, we're eating it in salads, you know. Anyways, in the past 10 to 20 years, we've started to see it being used more and more for production of stuff like lettuce and other produce, primarily leafy greens. But the thing is, a lot of these massive vertical farms, they get hundreds of millions of dollars in funding and then they don't work out. A lot of times these massive companies are paying an obscene amount of money in labor because it's incredibly highly skilled work. It's a little bit of agriculture mixed with a lot of science, mixed with some chemistry, with mixed with some botany, you know, a huge assortment of different skills are needed in order to grow produce vertically. We are building an incredibly perfected process where somebody who has no concept, no knowledge of what vertical farming is can show up at grow space and get some work done. The other big issue these companies are having is the sheer humongous cost that is their electricity bills. I mean, look at this, this costs a fortune, right? It's really expensive to power all of these lights and the pumps and the circulating fans. Um, but the big thing is, it can be offset. So a lot of these companies, what they're doing is they're just installing a bunch of solar panels. So that works out quite well. But by keeping at smaller scales, like we're doing here, instead of having these massive facilities, we reduce that power. And now we get to the point where, oh wow, if we actually reduce the size of the location, that electricity bill becomes a little bit more manageable. So another big issue that these companies are having is they're using the same old tired methods that we already discussed don't work in the traditional system. Where food is shipped across the country, we lose around 40% of it to food waste, whether that is in the grocery store or that is in the truck, which is obviously just lost cost. So instead of shipping across the country, keeping it super duper local, keeping it small and keeping it local, where it's now direct to consumer as well. So now, hey, I have got a bag of lettuce for you. Here you go. Perfect. Instead of the process where the other guys have to go in. Oh, okay, here you go. Here's a big old head of lettuce. Stick it in the truck. 
leave, go to a distribution center, it sits there for another day, leave it there, now it's at a grocery store, at that grocery store it sits for a week, and then from that grocery store it finally gets into your house, you don't need it for a few days, it's two or three week old head of lettuce, and it's not going to be as good as it was day one. So now that I've kind of explained why we're doing what we're doing, let's go into the farm and actually show you how we're doing. I mean, we're doing all these different processes. How are we actually making good produce? I mean, that's the more exciting part to be frank. Let's go take a peek. I just want to make a quick note before I step into the farm is that my foot is not looking too good right now. So I'm kind of hobbling around. You're like, oh my gosh, he's got a boot on his foot. I'm doing great, but it is why I'm walking kind of funky and why I got this big old boot on. So let's get in the farm and show you some actual produce. Okay, so it is pretty loud in here, so I'm going to have to speak up and you're going to hear all this fan noise, but I promise you that we are doing okay. Um, so the first big thing you see right when you walk in the grocery are these. These are tower garden farms. So these are considered aeroponic towers, which means that the roots are exposed completely to the air. So instead of needing them to be in soil or in water, like in our hydroponic systems, they're in the air. And that also means we can run the pumps less. So the pumps are on for about five minutes, every 45 minutes, which is way better for electricity consumption. So these are ebb and flow systems. So the way that these things work is that they are empty majority of the time. Uh, and then twice a day, once at five, once at another five, they fill up with water and that is all the plants need. So they're in these medium right here. Uh, this is our biggest waste in our uh, farm by far, are these little guys here, these rock wool. And the reason why these things are such a waste is because we can't reuse them. They are shipped away with the produce and this is, I would say, and most everyone here would say, this is our biggest waste, is these rock wool cubes. And they're not compostable, which is kind of annoying. Uh, we're working on finding a solution for this to make it so that these are compostable. Um, we haven't got there yet, but we're working on it. So uh, getting into this, my grandma, she has been going absolutely bonkers with these things. Uh, they look absolutely incredible. I mean, just look at them, wow. Um, and these things look beautiful. So microgreens are pretty interesting. So what they are, they're babies of their adult versions. So this here are peas, so speckled peas that are at the baby state. I love these things, I'm just gonna eat one right now. Okay, sorry. So these peas, the way microgreens work is you seed them, there's a whole tray of these little guys, these little pea seeds. They literally just look like peas because that's what they are. Then they get put down here, they grow up, and they look like this. All right, now moving out of our microgreens and our seeding system, we come right on over to our beautiful NFT system. Now, um, this system right here and these microgreen systems over here are completely proprietary, which means we've designed them ourselves. So we designed this whole system, we designed this whole spaghetti of a mess of plumbing. I wanna say obviously, cause it is looking like a mess. So I'm gonna say obviously. <laughs> obviously this is not a bought product cause it looks like a mess, but it works beautifully. It makes absolutely incredible growing produce and it's honestly quite quiet, which I am. And normally there's a lot of fans on in here that I've turned off, but it is actually more quiet than I realized it was. And if you honestly guys have any questions, like be more than feel free to uh, ask me any questions in the comments below. I will answer them either in the form of a video or in the form of just I respond, you know? Um, and I would love to answer any questions I get because I love this stuff. And <laughs> I, I, I don't know, that sounds pretty nerdy. I'm a nerd, obviously, but I mean, yeah, I'm absolutely loving this stuff. Now, I really wanna show you guys the upstairs. Ah, ooh, stairs are hard, I assure you. Oh, it's actually kind of a nice view too. Ah, oh, almost just fell. All right, all right. As you can see, woo, look at this place. It's looking absolutely incredible. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording. Get upstairs in a way that I don't fall. All right, see you up there. Oh, this is kind of boring. Yeah, it's a little bit more boring than you might've been expecting. So this is around twice the square footage as we got on the downstairs. So this actually used to be a furniture store. So a furniture store with a lot of open space. And a lot of open space is great for growing lettuce. So it's all wide open. 
So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope this really cleared up like why Grossface exists and why we are doing what we are doing. Um, and uh, if you have any ideas uh, for videos that you think would be great for this channel, uh, put them down below. I will definitely uh, look into making them. Uh, I've got a whole lot of ideas though too, so stay tuned.